people of God, <coughs> we live in an unpredictable technological world, <coughs> an unpredictable technological world. Artificial intelligence is taking us to strange places where no man has gone before. Uh, some of you saw the video of one of my Moscow friends who put up a video of me talking about worship in perfect Mandarin accent. Of course, the only problem is I speak zero Mandarin. My mouth was moving, but I wasn't the one uttering the words. The possibilities for good and ill are endless. We may live in an era where in 10 years, just 10 years, countries and islands with no developed alphabet may possess an alphabet and a Bible translation based on that alphabet through artificial intelligence. If they have one sample of that language to work with, the algorithm could produce an entire grammar. Bible translation, get this, Bible translation work may be accomplished in one day what we have accomplished in 300 years. And we may be only 10 years from that reality. On the other hand, you may receive a phone call tomorrow from a computerized voice identical to one of the people you love the most in this world, and that loved one will tell you that he or she is in deep trouble and needs you to transfer immediately $5,000. And you will think the request is a little bit odd, but then the voice sounds so familiar, and you'll happily send your $5,000 to a scammer in Southeast Asia or Manhattan. We live in an unpredictable technological world. At the same time, we all know this morning that there's nothing new under the sun. Technology won't create a new heavens and new earth. Technology won't create a new set of ethics. It will create ethical challenges, yes, indeed, but not a new set of ethics. Ethics is either good or ethics is evil. You can follow God's word or you can die through his word. Third John, our little missile, our little epistle, offers us a very predictable covenant model, a predictable covenant model. And here's the model for us this morning. If you imitate good things, you are imitating God. But if you imitate evil things, you don't know God, John says. If you imitate good things, you know God. If you don't imitate good things, you don't know God. Whatever tool it may be, AI, flying cars, traveling submarines, restaurant robots, alternative world, simulator games, or whatever. It either does good or it hinders the good. It gives you greater knowledge into who God is or it moves you away from the true God. The life of the church is very much the same way. The church is composed of people who are by nature imitative. People are by nature imitative. We show up on Sundays. When you show up on Sundays, and what happens is you are the accumulation of everything you have loved and hated throughout the week. If we have imitated good, if we have spent a significant amount of time imitating the good, this morning you may be filled with vigor. You're even dancing through the liturgy. But if you have imitated evil throughout the week, you're going to limp your way through the liturgy. You're going to walk as if you're in utter pain. But either way, whether you have imitated the good or whether you have imitated the evil, you're going to stand for God's absolution. Because whether good or evil, all of us here this morning are in need of the grace of Jesus. All of us. Some are in need of the grace of Jesus to revel in God's goodness, and some are in need of the grace of Jesus to repent of imitating the ugly in their lives. Pastor Gaius in 3 John has his share of problems. We have seen that already in the last two Sundays. He has his concerns about certain people within the congregation who are doing evil things, leading astray, and in particular, he names names. He says, Diatrophes, whose name means one who is nurtured by Zeus, one who is nurtured by the God, Diatrophes, thinks himself to be a god. Diatrophes, John says, he is imitating evil. That's what he's doing. 
He is using the tools of society to tempt others in the church to pursue bad church etiquette, bad church manners. Instead of setting an example of godliness, instead of setting an example of holiness, instead of setting an example of repentance, Diotrephes refuses to admit that he is ever wrong. John says he puts himself first. Now I know we all do that at some time or another, don't we? We can all put ourselves before others. We all pursue things selfishly at times. But Diatrophes makes this a full-time job. His behavior is predictable. There is AI, but then there is SI, which is sinful intelligence. And sinful intelligence is when you use all your book smarts and your street smarts to manipulate people to get what you want. That's sinful intelligence. Manipulating people, using your background, your history, your cleverness, your wit, to get what you want. And Diatrophes is going to use whatever status that has been given him in the church to take over because he knows best. He believes he knows best. And what he does is he takes advantage of the vulnerability of the institution to exert his way into the leadership of the church. And John is very aware of this. Remember, John is the great presbyter, the archbishop of this area. John says to pastor, to a local pastor, to Gaius, he says, encourage your congregation, Pastor Gaius. How do you encourage your congregation? He says in 3 John, beloved, do not imitate evil, but imitate good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. You see the theology of imitation emerging here in the pages here. And this theology of imitation, I want to grant you this morning that a theology of imitation is extremely daunting. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11. He says, be imitators of me just as I imitate Christ. That's what Paul says. Now, most of us would shy away from such a statement, wouldn't we? You might say, I know my thoughts. Or, I, I can understand your sentiments this morning when you say, I know who I am. Why would I ask anybody to imitate me? But consider Paul's life, the one who uttered those profound words this morning. What does Paul say? Who is the Apostle Paul? Remember, Paul was the, let me give you his resume, Paul was the architect of works-based religion. Paul was the architect of works-based religion. And he was the orchestrator behind the death of Christians. I am pretty sure none of you can claim such a resume. None of you. And Paul still says, imitate me. How so? How? By repenting. By refusing to live a life of gossiping the congregation. By taking counsel from others, even when you think you know everything. Yes, son, imitate me, son. Imitate me, my daughter. Not in my perfection, but in my deep grasp of my imperfection and my trust in the perfect Christ. That is how you imitate me. So I urge you to quit trying to be more pious than Paul and John and Peter. Diatrophes was an example, John tells us, of an evil imitator. But then there's another name that John lists for us. Another name is mentioned. If there's a name that exemplifies evil imitation, there is another name given that exemplifies the good. John says to imitate the good like this man named Demetrius. Imitate Demetrius. And what is it that's said of Demetrius? Listen to the words of 3 John. Demetrius has received a good testimony from everyone and from the truth itself. We also add our testimony, and you know, you know, because you know our example, you know that our testimony is true. Now, there are several layers to this statement here in 3 John, but the first thing that's very obvious is that it seems that Demetrius is the opposite of diatrophies in posture. Demetrius is the opposite of diatrophies in posture. He is a hospitality connoisseur. He wants people to come into his home. And when people are coming from out of town, when missionaries are coming to visit, when people are coming to find refuge and a comfortable place to stay, he says, stay here with me. 
stay in my home, eat my food. Instead of pushing people away, Demetrius is known as the kind of man who draws people closer to the church, not farther away. And the thing is, everyone in the first Presbyterian church of the first century there, everyone under the pastorate of Pastor Gaius, everyone testifies that Demetrius, he is legitimate. He is the real deal. But don't you overlook, please do not overlook the use of this phraseology in the text because to me, it is phenomenal. Listen to what is said. And this is what you want to be said of you even at your death one day. John says that everyone spoke good of Demetrius' testimony and the truth itself confirmed his good testimony. The truth itself, John treats truth as if truth were a person which is probably a reference to the truthful ones in the congregation. And those who love the truth, they also testify. Truth is personified in this letter here. Even truth looks at Demetrius and says, not bad, sir, not bad. It's like Demetrius was the one who receives the approval of the people. Not so he can exert his way into the congregation as diatrophies, but that he can come humbly within the congregation and be the one who brings peace within the body, who reconciles, who instead of gossiping speaks a good word, a benediction over others. Now what's really fascinating about 3 John here is that it's very likely that Demetrius, was the one who carried John's letter to Pastor Gaius. And when, when Demetrius arrived at the church and he saw everything that was happening, guess who wouldn't let him in the church or in his home? Guess who wouldn't share a meal with him? Guess who wouldn't say one kind thing about him? Guess who was trying to lord over him? Diotrephes. It's very likely the Diotrephes was the one telling the people, don't let this guy into your home. He is going to say bad things about me. I hate him. He's the kind of guy who speaks truth when he comes around us. I don't want to be confronted. I want to continue in my comfort zone. I don't want to leave that stage of comfort and piety. I don't want to leave that stage of self-created authority. I don't want to leave that stage. I want to remain here. I want to remain controlling people's lives with no accountability. I want to remain in a position where I just tell everyone what to do without having to imitate anything that I tell them to do. Demetrius, most likely, is the one who challenges the status quo created by diatrophies in that church pastored by Gaius. Because Demetrius is an imitator of the good. Demetrius doesn't use his sinful intelligence. He uses his sanctified intelligence to build an environment where grace is manifestly present within the congregation. He uses his sanctified intelligence to build people up. And I got to tell you, some people hate Demetrius's in the church. They don't like him at all. Now, the people who hate Demetrius, they're not going to advertise their hate of the good, but they're going to live in such a way that they demonstrate that they are not in love with the good. They're always going to be on a mission to find fault in others. They're never going to be content with the charity of others. Now, they don't do the good, but they're very quick to let others know that they don't like the way they do it. And in church life, the ones who do the least typically complain the most about those who do. The ones who do the least typically complain the most about those who do. Demetrius is not, in our passage, praised for his perfection. Demetrius is praised for his pursuit of truth. He's spoken as someone here who is predictable in his behavior, he has faults, but he's a testimony of virtue in this congregation. And John ends this letter with some notes that many, perhaps in our evangelical culture, would feel, why this, John? This is so unnecessary. Why are you adding your footnotes to your main thesis? 
This is how he concludes this letter. Beginning verse 13, I had much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. I hope to see you soon and that we will talk face to face. Peace be with you. The friends greet you. Greet the friends. Greet them each by name. Tell them who they are. Look at them in the face and say, brother, I love you. Sister, I love you. I want to be with you. I enjoy, I'm encouraged by your hospitality. Greet them by name. Pass on the peace. Because when we speak in this congregation of the tangibility of the Christian life, this is what I mean. Precisely what John has said here. The great Neil Postman once wrote, Americans no longer talk to each other. They entertain each other. They do not exchange ideas. They exchange images. They do not argue with propositions. They argue with good looks, celebrities, and commercials. This was written 40 years ago. 40 years ago. A Christian community only thrives when you engage one another in the body. This morning, look for one person that does not look familiar to you. Introduce yourself after the service. I speak to a lot of high school and college groups around the country, and the clearest way I've always noticed when I'm speaking to an audience for someone to stand out in the pack is when they engage the speaker, when they ask questions, when they look someone right in the eye when they are talking. Why is that significant? Why is that not just trivial, something to be put aside? Because life in the body includes manners. Life in the body includes etiquette. Life in the body includes gratitude. Life in the body includes meals. It includes texts. It includes encouragement. It includes all these things to form the kind of congregation that thrives even amid difficulties. Listen. God keeps adding to our numbers here at Providence, and to whom much is given, trust me, much is required of you. Don't waste your membership. Don't waste your membership. Don't waste the opportunity to greet one another face to face. It is remarkable that the members of the first century's church cherished being with one another, and the members of the 21st century church Cherish being away from one another. But John has a deep longing to be with God's people, to greet them by name, to experience life in the congregation of the righteous. When I speak to ministers, the one thing that all these churches have in common is that the longer you're in that congregation, the more you see its faults, but the more invested you are in the congregation, the greater your ability will be to see the redemption of God working right through it. Now, it would be very hard to talk about community life without quoting the patron saint of Christian community, but here's a quote for Dietrich Bonhoeffer. The person who loves their dream of community will destroy community. The person who loves their dream of community will destroy community. But the person who loves those around them will create and establish community. In other words, community life, brothers and sisters, requires thick skin. If you're offended by anything, you'll always be in a defensive posture, waiting or even, even looking for the next potential offense. But similarly, you need a high view of sin in the church so that you can develop an even higher view of God's forgiveness in the congregation. The dream for us this morning, the dream is not community. That's not the dream. The dream is the sacred people within that community. It's the people that create sacred spaces in this body. And for John, for the Apostle John, when we greet one another with God's peace, as we're about to do at this sacred table, we are creating a community in love. We're doing the predictable, virtuous thing. And therefore, we will receive the predictable reward of those who imitate the good and hate the evil. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.